Hi everyone and welcome back to Learner Radiology. I wanted to say hi to everyone. It's been a little bit since we've had some content. This is going to be the first lecture in some coverage of uh, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases of the central nervous system. In this first lecture, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an introduction, tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover in the other portions of the lecture. Then we're going to cover demyelinating disease. So we'll spend some time talking about demyelinating disease both in the brain and in the spine. So this is going to be a case-based overview, and as part of that, we're going to cover many of the most common autoimmune and inflammatory processes that you're going to see on imaging in the CNS. We'll talk about some common mimics and imaging pitfalls, so some of the things that you might run into that might uh, mimic autoimmune and inflammatory things like infection, uh, some genetic conditions, metabolic syndromes, and things like that. So we're going to cover all of that uh, over the course of several lectures. Now, there are going to be about six divided lectures here. In the one today, we're going to talk about demyelinating diseases, mainly multiple sclerosis, NMO, and ADEM. In some of the other lectures, we'll talk about encephalitides and the co common causes of encephalitis, particularly those inflammatory encephalitides. We'll have a separate lecture where we'll talk about the kind of mass-like inflammatory diseases, uh, typically the ones you see are sarcoid and orbital inflammatory disease. We'll talk about spine inflammatory disease, so transverse myelitis, sarcoid. We'll talk about amyloidomas and uh, manifestations of amyloid disease, so amyloid angiopathy or CAA, inflammatory amyloid and amyloidomas. And then finally, we'll have a separate lecture where we'll talk about vascular processes. So without further ado, we're going to drop right into these and we'll talk about demyelinating disease. Now, at this point, I want to give you a warning. This concept of CNS inflammatory uh, and autoimmune diseases is really a huge category of diseases. Many of them look the same and the clinical history and labs are really going to be what set them apart. So you may not be able to tell based on imaging. Um, my other warning is this is not intended to be comprehensive. This is not going to be every autoimmune and inflammatory disease. So just be aware, uh, this will hopefully give you uh, some coverage of what are going to be the most common uh, diseases. Uh, we'll gain some awareness of which is most common and uh, hopefully you can recognize some of the key pearls uh, for clinical testing. So without further ado, we're gonna talk about demyelinating diseases. Now the main ones we're gonna talk about are MS, NMO, and uh, ADEM, or its variant with hemorrhage, AHEM. And we'll talk a little bit more about these as we move along. So each of these is gonna be a case. We're gonna have a case presentation and we'll talk about, uh, we'll see some of the imaging, and then we'll talk about the imaging findings and what uh, are the key considerations here. So the first case is going to be a 35-year-old woman with right lower extremity weakness. And here's some of the imaging here. You have a flare on the left. This is diffusion on the right here. I'll just give you a second to look at those. Move on. We have flare and diffusion again, just from a little bit higher in the brain. Take a look at those now. So what you're seeing is you have some periventricular white matter flare abnormalities. Maybe it's a little bit faintly bright on TWI, but nothing too much to worry about. If you just keep coming a little bit higher, you see a little bit more of the same. So by now, you should really be having some thoughts about what uh, about what you think this is, especially in the context of this lecture. Now here we have pre and post contrast imaging. So it's pre contrast on the left here and post contrast on the right. So you do see there are some areas of enhancement. You might say those are areas of ring enhancement. If you come a little bit higher, you see it a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Additional areas of enhancement. Finally, you have this final image. You see sort of similar findings throughout all of these. On the pre-contrast, there's uh, nothing. And then on the post-contrast, you have either small areas of enhancement or areas of ring-like enhancement. So this is what multiple sclerosis looks like. And multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune demyelinating disease. You tend to get lesions that are periventricular in the corpus callosum or pericolosum. Uh, regions. You have subcortical and cortical lesions. Uh, the most common presentation is going to be an optic neuritis or visual changes. Active lesions tend to enhance on post-contrast imaging. So those that we saw that were enhancing, those are active lesions with an active inflammatory component. They can evolve the cervical and thoracic spine, and MS is more common in women than it is in men. So let's review this imaging a little bit here. So we have a periventricular distribution of lesions. So it's this deep white matter here and periventricular white matter. On post-contrast, you see that, as we pointed out, these ring-enhancing lesions, which look like this, a couple of little other dots of enhancement that you see there as well. 
Now, if you look at other projections, now this is something that is actually quite common that you need to be familiar with. This is what we would refer to as an incomplete rim of enhancement. So this lesion has a peripheral enhancement, but it doesn't go all the way around. It's a sort of broken rim. This is almost classic uh, for demyelinating disease. And so it's very common for these lesions to look like this. So when you see that, even if it's big and mass like looks like a tumor, think about tumor effective demyelination. So let's move on to our next case, which is going to be a 45 year old woman with tingling and weakness, prior episodes of weakness and numbness. So a very similar history to what we already saw. Now we have some images from the spine. We have a cervical spine, we have a T2, we have a T2 fat sat or stir image. And then we have a post contrast image with fat saturation. Here we just see some axial images through the central portion there. Maybe you see something a little funny about the spinal cord there. Now, this is just an image from the brain, so you can see what the brain may look like. Nothing really to see there. This is a flare image, it looks pretty normal. Here are some images through the orbits. So from the back of the orbits, you can get a look at the optic nerves. Maybe that's a clue. Now this is a case of neuromyelitis optica. This is typically a triad of optic neuritis and myelitis. Uh, you usually have an aquaporin-4 antibody that's present about 70% of the time. The common presentation of these patients is a myelopathy or weakness and visual changes. For the brain, it's much more likely to be normal than an MS. The lesions tend to be larger. For the spine lesions, they tend to be longer segments and involve uh, what we would call longitudinally extensive or more than three vertebral bodies. They tend to involve the central cord. You may or may not see enhancement with these, like about one out of three will enhance. You may say optic neuritis. You may uh, see optic nerve atrophy. So let's take a look back here. And uh, what we see is if you look here at around C6, you see some abnormal T2 signal within the cord itself. The cord is maybe a little bit of expanded. You see the contour like comes out a little bit. If you look closely at this post contrast image, you see a little bit of a rim of enhancement and perhaps it's not completely enhancing around the rim. So very similar to what you see in the brain for demyelinating lesions. Here you see through the orbits, what I wanted you to see is a little bit of subtle abnormality of the right optic nerve here. So if you look at the optic nerve, it's a little bit faintly brighter than the other. It's certainly not frankly abnormal. It's not enhancing or anything but it kind of makes you think that there's been some prior insult to the right optic nerve. Uh, here you see just after six months, this person has been given treatment and you've seen resolution of that uh, lesion in the cervical cord there at C5-C6. The contour of the cord is back more to normal and some of that T2 hyperintensity or edema has decreased. So you see that these can get better with time and treatment. I uh, hear you see the resolution of the enhancement as well. So you see the little bit of enhancement that you had there on the six month follow up has resolved. For comparison, when you're looking at multiple sclerosis versus NMO, for multiple sclerosis, the brain tends to be involved more commonly, or you'll see greater brain involvement than the spine. Whereas for NMO, it's flipped. Uh, multiple sclerosis does frequently involve the optic nerve. So both can really involve the optic nerves. MS tends to involve shorter segments of the spine, so you'll tend to have short lesions that are maybe half a vertebral body or less, whereas NMO will tend to have longer segment lesions. The central cord is more likely to be involved in NMO versus MS, which tends to be more peripheral. And the aquaporin antibodies on clinical testing is really the key that uh, gets you through to it being NMO. For this next case, we have a 25-year-old chef. Uh, he's been experiencing left shoulder pain and left side weakness for two days, now a little bit of drowsiness. So a younger patient. Here we see some images through the brainstem and kind of upper cerebellum. You know, this uh, little abnormality in the superior cerebellar peduncle there on the left. It's a little bit abnormal in diffusion. This is flare, diffusion, and post contrast here. So that lesion has a little bit of enhancement. We'll go a little higher. You see that that lesion is not isolated. You have a number of lesions in both the basal ganglia, the corpus callosum, some callosal lesions back here. Now in diffusion, these are pretty bright actually. Uh, so you see some abnormalities there. On post contrast, you have some enhancement there. Again, kind of this fluffy enhancement. Maybe it's a little bit more peripheral. It's around the periphery of some of these lesions. Here you see a little bit higher. There's just uh, some additional lesions in the periventricular white matter. You see a little bit of enhancement, maybe a little bit of a rim that you're getting there. Uh, but a little bit of enhancement again there. 
Now in this patient, it's an acute illness. So this is an acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM. This is an acute illness where it's usually monophasic, like it's usually younger patients, an equal distribution of males and females. In lab findings, you'll have CSF. You'll have too many cells in your CSF. You will have myeloblastic protein frequently in the CSF. Uh, you can also have detectable antibodies with these anti-MOG or anti-MOG antibodies being present a good fraction of the time. Now, for these patients, you can have supertentorial or infratentorial lesions. Uh, you tend to have a little bit less deep gray involvement and thalamic involvement, although in this case, you, you certainly did have that. Uh, less involvement of the cortex and subcortical white matter less spine involvement. Now, some of these patients are going to go on to have a fulminant disease, but a little more than half of these patients are going to totally recover and not have any additional sequela. You can't have some longstanding uh, negative outcomes. Uh, death is even possible in some of these patients if it proceeds to this kind of fulminant stage. Here's just that uh, same case again. What you're seeing again is flare abnormalities in the basal ganglia here, corpus callosum, with abnormal diffusion and abnormal enhancement. Uh, this would be, could be MS, but it's pretty fulminant because you have a lot of enhancing lesions. It's also kind of an atypical demographic, like it's a little bit younger person. And so just kind of think about that when you see multiple disseminated enhancing lesions. Now, if this patient went on to have long-term follow-up. What you see is you have volume loss, really no new lesions, but you do have chronic gliosis. So there's some pretty bad volume loss. You see the ventricles are too large here. You see that this uh, white matter around the ventricles is uh, pretty... Uh, pretty gliotic here, so it's pretty T2 right, but no enhancement at this time. This companion case is a 31-year-old with HIV and seizure. Here you see similar findings. Uh, it's perhaps even more dramatic. Uh, you've got marked T2 abnormality in the bilateral thalami, which are very swollen. You've got pretty bad flare in the paraventricular right matter back here, involvement of the splenium of the corpus callosum. This is diffusion in the center here. You see pretty bad diffusion abnormality, but you'll look at this peripheral rim. So again, think about the uh, this being a demyelinating process. You've got some diffusion abnormality in the paraventricular white matter there. Uh, this patient also has on GRE, so you see some punctate areas of abnormal susceptibility there in the bilateral thalami. So that's hemorrhage internally within some of these lesions. This patient went on to uh, pass away from a disseminated encephalitis. This is just an aggressive case of uh, acute uh, encephalomyelitis. This is the hemorrhagic version, which is sometimes referred to as AHEM or acute hemorrhagic encephalomyelitis, which is an ADEM plus hemorrhage. Now, the other things you have to think about is if you have sort of relapse, uh, that can be uh, sort of uh, referred to as RDEM or relapsing disseminated encephalomyelitis or multiphasic. Uh, these are all kind of on the same spectrum based on whether it uh, happens again. There's sort of a contentious debate about whether these repetitive or recurrent uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis are the same or different process from MS. And it can be quite challenging, like once you're talking about someone having multiple episodes. Now, key mimic we're gonna take a look at here. This is a 24 year old woman with difficulties in speech, vision, and headache. Uh, here you see kind of a similar looking appearance. This is flare through the upper brain stem. Maybe a little bit of abnormal flare around the fourth ventricle there. Not too bad on diffusion here. You come up, you have a little bit more abnormal flare, perhaps in the right thalamus, the splenium of the corpus callosum, some abnormal diffusion there. So it looks very similar. Now you see these scattered kind of pericolosal lesions here, just above the uh, margins of the lateral ventricles. They're abnormal on diffusion as well. I'm showing you this MRA. So it's some images from an MRA of the head and neck just to show you that they're normal. So these are not, uh, we're not thinking that this is necessarily uh, a stroke-like process or something from uh, atherosclerotic disease or anything like that. Uh, this is a Susak syndrome and Susak syndrome is a syndrome where you get multiple infarctions of the cochlea, the retina, and the brain. And that leads to this clinical triad of hearing loss, vision changes, and encephalopathy. What you see on imaging is you see these white matter lesions involving the corpus callosum, the syndrome timia valley, they tend to be smaller than a demyelinating disease, but they can often enhance. Uh, you can have DWI abnormalities or DWI can be, can be normal. So to summarize here, we have a variety of demyelinating diseases that you can see uh, in the brain and spine. The most common is going to be multiple sclerosis, which is going to be most common in young and middle-aged women.
they have a periventricular distribution and when you see it in the spine it tends to be a short segment nmo tends to have less involvement of the brain and longer segment spine lesions and it's associated with these anti-aquaporin antibodies so you need to be familiar with that now when you have a fulminant presentation of demyelinating disease so you see a lot of lesions a lot of them are enhancement enhancing at the same time often in a single episode think about adem or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis now a common mimic of these is an autoimmune vasculopathy called SUSAC syndrome where you get this triad of encephalopathy hearing loss and vision loss and that's from multiple small infarcts in the periventricular white matter and uh, and then in the retina and cochlea which causes those other uh, symptoms so this is kind of the spectrum of demyelinating disease that you might uh, expect to see on imaging of the brain and spine uh, it can be impossible to differentiate these at a single time point so if you don't have a history like it, you may be looking at uh, one slice in time of any of these diseases so you've got to bring the whole clinical picture into bear find any outside imaging if it's available or, or other imaging that can tell you a little bit about the history for these patients so this is going to be the end of this demyelinating portion of this uh, please tune in to see the rest of the lecture we're going to have uh, five more lectures about autoimmune and inflammatory processes within the brain and spine so uh, be on the lookout for those uh, thanks for tuning into the lecture today uh, be sure to check out some of the additional uh, content on our channel and uh, be sure to hit the button to subscribe if you uh, enjoy the channel thank you